Uh, my name is Andrew Brenton I'm with WHA, as Mary Kay uh, mentioned earlier. And I want to welcome everyone to our next session, New and Emerging Threats from A to Zika. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Peter Schultz. Dr. Schultz is the Associate Director of the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene and the Director of the Communicable Disease Division and Laboratory, uh, excuse me, Emergency Laboratory Response, also for the State Lab of Hygiene. He holds a PhD in medical microbiology and has over 30 years of experience in clinical and public health microbiology. Dr. Schultz currently directs statewide emergency laboratory response during disease outbreaks and public health emergencies. And he oversees influenza and respiratory virologic surveillance. He serves on numerous local, state, and national public health preparedness and response work groups with primary focus on pandemic influenza, vaccine preventable diseases, laboratory diagnostics, biosafety, and laboratory network development. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Schultz. Thanks for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, just one addition uh, to the 30 years experience. I started young when I was about 15, so just to <laughs> highlight that, I can wish. Um, well, again, thanks for having me. Uh, uh, when I was asked to do this presentation, it's one I do often, uh, or, or uh, very similar to uh, laboratories and public health community. Um, and this is a little unusual um, uh, audience for me, so I took a little different uh, approach with this. And in the uh, byline, in the description, uh, it said, how can hospitals better prepare for these threats? Um, what I wanted to do is uh, not take the broader view. You're getting a lot of that uh, today. Uh, but mention a couple things and then tell you how I'm going to deal with it in the presentation. So uh, I think it's important, and I'm kind of speaking to the choir uh, here, uh, you need to be aware and um, uh, prepare yourself, inform yourself about the different uh, threats. And I know what you're really focused on here are more of the uh, point-in-time type threats, uh, those things that might have uh, huge public health consequences in terms, in terms of morbidity and mortality, uh, uh, or, or race concerns and, and fears and uncertainty, and generally have a large public health uh, effect. And, uh, but what we do, or what the public health issues really go beyond those big time events, and we'll, we'll talk a little about uh, that. So you need to know what the threats are, um, why do they continue to occur? Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, the broad issues of uh, some of these infectious diseases toward the end of the talk. Why are we going to continue to confront these uh, uh, for the foreseeable future? Uh, know your sources of information, and I will share a number of those uh, uh, with you. And then um, something, I, 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 again, I know uh, I, I saw the makeup of this audience, uh, I think it is important that you need to recognize who are your partners and public health uh, are, uh, should be all of our major partners and I'll, I'll talk a little about that and the role we play in supporting public health. But I really want to focus on uh, kind of a subset of partnerships that many of you may not be as aware of and that's uh, the laboratories. Um, I'm going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about State Lab of Hygiene, State's Public Health Lab in particular, but more importantly, the networks we put in place over the last 20 years with your clinical laboratories throughout the state. I think most of you, uh, hopefully all of you, know you've got clinical laboratories. I think you know their role in terms of patient care, but I know because we meet with them and talk with them a lot, uh, a lot of your administrators, and perhaps a lot of you, 
do not know the critical role they play in emergency response to infectious diseases. And I want to kind of enlighten you on that because I'll tell you at the outset, everything I'm going to talk about here uh, and the networks and the capacity we built uh, in this state, not to mention nationally, these efforts are going on throughout the uh, uh, United States, uh, simply would not be possible without the clinical labs participating. And it's not like we give them enormous financial incentive to do so. These are largely uh, uh, volunteer kind of in, in air quotes, but I think they do it in Wisconsin because they really believe in the bigger public health picture and their role in it. So hopefully <clears throat> I'll enlighten you, tell you a little of the background, historical perspective of why, where we're at right now, uh, and how we've developed this network and some of the uh, things that this network is doing. Hopefully this will be information <clears throat> that your further preparedness and response efforts you'll be able to draw on. <clears throat> Um, I, I'll have other resources throughout uh, the presentation, uh, but one of the ones I highlight, and in, again, you may be aware of the CDC has terrific uh, resources. Uh, you can go up in the upper right-hand corner, and every disease, if you're doing it on a disease-by-disease -disease basis, one information, you can just get to the uh, highlight, uh, get into an alphabetized list and learn whatever information you want basically about it, any infectious disease that you want, current or, or otherwise. The information is set up for professionals, for the general public, uh, for clinicians, laboratories, and so on. Tremendous resource. The second circle I've highlighted, and I'll come back to this uh, a little later on, they also have a very well-developed uh, portion of their website uh, specifically for emergency preparedness and response. And it isn't just about infectious diseases or bioterrorism, it's uh, and, and a term I'll use throughout today's talk. It truly is all hazards. So obviously uh, uh, one of the big issues if you go on the website is hurricane preparedness and response with what our southeast is going through uh, and we'll be going through uh, over the next several weeks. So if you're not aware of that website, I, I really encourage you uh, to visit it. So I want to launch into a little historical perspective, tell you why we're worried about uh, these emerging diseases and uh, what public health and what uh, laboratories are, are doing about it. Um, and for me, it's kind of been a cool thing and fairly easy to do because uh, what I'm going to share with you absolutely tracks my career. I began at the State Lab uh, in 1988 uh, and was the director uh, uh, of the division by 1993. And the whole evolution of, of my area of the lab, and I'll talk specifically a few slides down the road about the public health, or about the state lab and where we're located and some of the things we do uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But everything we do in terms of response to communicable disease is actually tracked my career path. So I've been so blessed to actually be part of this. I've been a public health uh, practitioner my entire career. My career began more in a clinical hospital uh, setting, but that was uh, overseas. So my entire career has been dealing with uh, public health preparedness and response, laboratory preparedness and response to a whole host of, uh, of threats that have been emerged. And as a scientist, uh, it just doesn't get any better than that uh, when you uh, look at the science behind uh, all the threats we're having to deal with. And I'm always careful not to express too much enthusiasm and glee here, uh, but the fact is those of us who have committed to public health really do find this rewarding because what we're able to do now for a number of these threats. So kind of uh, my starting point, and I could start before this, is the real concern with emerging diseases, infectious diseases, the alarm was really uh, sounded uh, in a series of publications culminating in this report by the Institute of Medicine in 1992 where they first used the term uh, emerging disease. And you can see embedded in the definition uh, they refer to uh, uh, the last two decades. And the reason was there was a period of time during the 70s and 80s where actually the threat of uh, infectious disease 
uh, and our resources to deal with it really fell off the map. Uh, and we really allowed our infrastructure to deal with infectious diseases at all levels uh, kind of wane. And this was recognized and really one of the key events that got this report together and the eye, opening, uh, the eye opener for those in the clinical fields in public health uh, was the emergence of HIV uh, AIDS uh, in the early 80s and then the profound global impact it had uh, over the uh, decade uh, of the 80s. So in this book you can read all the background, all the diseases of concern at that point of time, um, and uh, a, a number of other things this report did then is fairly quickly began to answer the question, of, okay, we've got a problem here, what are we gonna to begin to do about it? How are we gonna address some of these threats? And one of the brilliant things they did is uh, they discuss hundreds of different diseases in there, but they made the point that you can't take on a problem by taking, on, taking it on disease by disease. It'll be a losing uh, effort. So they went back, or, or within there, uh, yeah, they went back historically and then uh, identified that there are factors that are responsible for disease emergence. And uh, in fact, the IOM report had an update 10, day, uh, 10 years later, which I have on the right of that slide, and between those two publications, they identify the disease emergence factors that are up there. There are those associated with humans, with us, with the microbes, uh, with our interactions uh, with animals and natures, the nature, and basically what's public health, how does public health factor in. And the one thing they called out in this report is uh, <clears throat> these disease uh, emerging uh, factors were uh, uh, proceeding, but public health allowed itself to drop its guard. And we really gave the advantage to the infectious diseases, and now we were going to begin to uh, uh, reap the problems that that was going to create. The other reason, they, uh, the rationale they gave for focusing on factors of disease emergence is not only do we want to understand why it's happening, and I'll talk a little about that at the very kind of the doom and gloom part of the, and toward the end of the talk before the optimistic part. Um, it's really, you have to understand factors before you can figure out how can we prevent this from happening uh, in, in the first place. And I think that was a real wise observation here. So if you understand the factors and can address those factors, you can have a profound effect on preventing these disease emergences. At least that's what was uh, relayed in the uh, document. Um, another thing that the IOM report did say fairly quickly, well, we need to be, get on this problem immediately. And they said that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, working with its public health partners, they need to take the lead here. And what I put up on the slide is uh, this, um, there were a, a strategic report was immediately developed about a year uh, after the IOM report, and then a second one which built on that about four years later. And basically it was emerging, uh, it was a strategic plan to address emerging disease threats. <clears throat> And because of the problems that had been highlighted in uh, the IOM report and how public health had allowed itself uh, to neglect uh, uh, response to infectious diseases, it looked at what do we need to bolster to better respond to infectious disease. So they identified a number of targets. We need to look for them and respond a lot more effectively across clinical and public health uh, uh, communities. Applied research, we need better diagnostic tests and we need the laboratorians working with the epidemiologists so we can uh, better monitor the diseases and respond when they do emerge. Uh, they identified infrastructure and training. We need to get people coming into the professions and we need to train them. We need to bolster the public health uh, workforce. And then um, just develop uh, and go back to a prevention uh, mindset rather than always trying to control the problems that have uh, occurred. 
So when we read this, and those of us who are aware of the IOM report, this was great news. We had a blueprint here how we could start moving forward. That was the good news. Uh, this was about 1994. The bad news was there was zero funding that came along with this. So at the time, uh, speaking for our lab, and I know public health uh, in general, funding is always kind of a roller coaster, and we were really down at the lower part of it. So it was great to have this great plan, and everybody was understanding what the problem was. It was extraordinarily frustrating that there wasn't going to be too much I could do about it. Uh, uh, in, in, until some funding came along. Uh, well, then an odd marriage with public health occurred right around the same time. Uh, there were concerns kind of in the context of emerging disease threats. It, all, it wasn't all about Mother Nature. Humans, if you look at that list of factors, human behavior kind of sits up at the top of the list for a lot of diseases. Uh, and leave it to the humans to come up with a way to top Mother Nature. And, that is uh, uh, a good example of, uh, of that is bioterrorism. A real concern began to develop in the mid, uh, early to mid-90s because we were just coming out of the Gulf War, uh, which we won with Iraq, the first uh, war we had with Iraq, and at the out uh, finish of that war, when the UN uh, went in and inspected, they found huge stocks of biological weapons and chemical weapons that would have been used, uh, is felt, if that war hadn't occurred. At the same time, right around 91, 92, the Soviet Union dissolved into its independent states <clears throat> in Russia. And they, uh, in an unusual uh, openness, came clean about their bioweapons program uh, that actually rivaled their nuclear weapons program. And looking around, seeing the age spectrum here, we all lived through, the, many of us lived through the 50s and 60s and knew what that uh, was about. Um, and the real concern there is uh, that these programs had been going on, but there were really no controls over the stocks that, of these weapons that may have occurred, uh, or that uh, may have existed. So there was really some thought now given what happens if there'd be a bioterrorism event. And I know a number of you, we went through this period through the uh, late uh, 90s where we really began to seriously prepare for something like this. Tabletop exercises, what would uh, the hospitals do, what would public health do, uh, and so on. Well, it takes us to 2001 and uh, really a remarkable uh, event for public health. Uh, obviously a horrible event for the United States, 9-11 uh, and the terrorist attack that we suffered. But another event that occurred six weeks later that I think a lot of people, particularly the general public, probably has forgotten is the anthrax attack that we suffered. Um, we had been preparing for something that would affect hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe kill hundreds of thousands of people. We went through endless exercises. How could hospitals deal with it? How would public health deal with it? Uh, and uh, so when the event finally happened, uh, there were 22 cases of, of anthrax uh, on the eastern seaboard and down in uh, Florida uh, that were, were acquired by a weaponized anthrax preparation that was sent out in the mail. 22 people uh, subsequently were infected, five of these people died. But those in public health and maybe some of your institutions, we went through a four to six month period of unprecedented panic in this country where every powder was now suspect. Uh, our public health laboratory, those around the country, ended up testing thousands and thousands of powders to rule out anthrax. Looking back, totally irrational, but it shows the power of fear, uh, which is one of the most powerful weapons that the terrorists uh, possess. Um, we knew that was bad when it immediately occurred. I don't think any of us uh, would have guessed that the profound impact that that event would have on public health. And uh, a whole lot of people in our legislature, uh, legislature gained religion after that event. And we were worrying about funding uh, bioterrorism or some of those other threats uh, uh, that we learned about in the IOM report. Uh, it is not over-exaggerating to say the money literally did begin to flow into public health and out to our partners 
uh, right around 2002. Uh, <clears throat> and if you look in there, it's a little hard to see in there. This, uh, uh, the money was meant to bolster public health response, um, how to deal with a mass casualty event at the community uh, level, uh, in the hospitals, how to better our clinicians deal with it. And what I've highlighted uh, here, how to better prepare our public health laboratories and public health to respond to a bioterrorism th uh, threat. And um, it came with a stipulation that whatever we begin to develop here, don't just focus on bioterrorism, make it all hazards. And I'll come back to that repeatedly because that's exactly what we've done now some 15, 16 years out. And if you can look at that graph <coughs> at the bottom of the slide, although there's been a slow erosion of that uh, a stream of funding, I can say, and I'll come to this a little later on, because of other events that have occurred, there's been constant infusion of other pots of money that have enabled public health to continue to maintain the capacities and build on the capacities that we began to build in the early 2000s. And it's a shame that we have to grow and have such a great uh, uh, public health response capacity and capability now at the expense of having to have a, suffer a terrorist attack and an anthrax attack to get there. Uh, and I hope someday, I don't have many years left in my career, but it'd really be nice to fund public health and the things we do down to the level of hospitals now proactively rather than wait for the next disaster. But in a sense, an important storm, so uh, that kind of was the silver lining of, of, of bioterrorism. And <clears throat> you'll see a little later on a couple other events. Uh, I come back to highlight, uh, it was really uh, after 9-11 uh, uh, and right around 2000, 2000 or, uh, right around 2002 or so, that CDC recommitted themselves to make their website a one-stop shop for everything having to do with uh, emergency preparedness and response. And again, I call out that part of their website here, and if you're not familiar with it, Tremendous resources, not only in preparedness efforts, but it becomes a central point of information when events do occur. <clears throat> so, what does this have to do with laboratory now? Well, we were called out as being a, a critical uh, component, uh, 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 laboratories at all levels, uh, to respond to bioterrorism or any public health threat. And a concept that had begun to be developed right around 2000. I was fortunate to be part of this process, working through my professional organization and with the CDC, uh, began to develop a concept for a laboratory, a national laboratory network, uh, which uh, when we got that funding, quickly emerged into a, uh, uh, from concept into an operational uh, network. Uh, and basically, this is the Lab Response Network, originally called the Lab Response Network for Bioterrorism. That ladder was dropped again because this should be an all hazards. Any infrastructure, anything we do to respond to an emergency shouldn't be built to respond to only one emergency because uh, it's going to fail you somewhere down the line. So if you take more of an all hazards approach, you can respond to all hazards. And there was a lot of wisdom that went into uh, kind of that philosophy here. So when you look at this, it's a pyramid shape uh, uh, scheme. At, sitting at the top are the National Reference Labs, CDC being the <clears throat> most well-known and prominent, and other US uh, military-related labs that have uh, tremendous scientific and diagnostic uh, capabilities. The center portion are the reference laboratories, and this is where my laboratory and public health laboratories around the country, not only at the state level, but the large local health department labs come into play. And sitting at the base, and I will make this statement repeatedly throughout the rest of the talk, is arguably the most important part of the pyramid, and that are the community-based clinical laboratories, uh, which reside in your hospitals. And in this scheme, they were called Sentinel Laboratories. And when I get to that part, it's kind of obvious why. They very much are our Sentinels for what might be happening at the community level. And a pathway 
to get specimens and information flowing to us at the state level and ultimately up to the CDC. A little about state labs, so because I'm going to talk a little uh, focus about CDC supports all of us, but really, uh, as you'll uh, see in a, a, a subsequent slide here, there are state labs throughout the country, and we network with all of them under the guidance of the CDC. So there's a network of public health labs uh, being guided by CDC, and then at the state level, we function kind of as the CDC and manage a network of clinical labs. So on a national scale, this really is a network of, of networks. And uh, having been very active in this for about the last 15 years, I'm uh, given something that big uh, and probably a thousand reasons why it shouldn't work, it really does uh, work, uh, which tells you a lot about communication and collaboration which you all, uh, I know, are very familiar with. So a little about the state lab. Uh, actually, we're Wisconsin's uh, public health laboratory. We have a distributed campus. Uh, our newer facility is out on the east side on Agriculture uh, Drive. Uh, we have our campus-based uh, uh, lab where we all used to live. Uh, I just moved out to the new lab uh, a year ago. Uh, that's still on, a, or, uh, on the campus on Henry Mall. It houses our administrative departments and one of our technical units. And then we have one other support area out at Walton Commons, which has our Office of Information Services and some other support functions. Um, a little about the state lab uh, organization. We're unusual from most other public health laboratories in the country in that uh, we're not part of the state health department. In fact, we're administratively part of the University of Wisconsin. We exist as an auxiliary unit in the School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, and I've been then doubly blessed in my career is not only get to serve public health, but do it uh, uh, as part of my alma mater. Uh, and it uh, gives us a lot of advantage in, in what we've been able to develop in the research and the collaborative uh, collaborations that we can have on campus. And I just put up the organization chart. I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but uh, what I'm talking about today really affects largely my division, the Communicable Disease Division. Although in the realm of terrorism, we have an environmental health division as well that normally is doing testing to support environmental uh, uh, causes. In the case of a chemical terrorism uh, or use of, of, a, of some kind of toxin, they actually have developed uh, uh, special diagnostic methods that would help in response uh, there as well. So again, state lab, in, even in the realm of terrorism, biological or chemical terrorism, kind of has, has an all hazards uh, uh, capability and capacity there. <coughs> and um, I, I just want to highlight uh, out our, although we're, we're part of the University of Wisconsin, we're still a public health entity. And I highlight here the partners uh, that we serve by statute uh, as a public health laboratory. And it's the State Division of Health and through them, uh, all of our local health department jurisdictions. We serve the DNR uh, uh, and uh, clinicians, and I list these. We have many other partners, but I list these because these are specifically called out in statute. Uh, again, we're not part of the health department. Everything we do is statutorily defined that relies on close communication and working relationships with our other public health partners. Again, a model that you don't see uh, very much throughout the country. So getting back now, talking a little about uh, from a network sense, every state participates in the laboratory response network because every state has at least one uh, public health laboratory. Then many large metropolitan areas also have larger public health laboratories that serve the local population, but we interact with them as well. <coughs> There's a smattering of other federal laboratories that kind of serve the same role that we do. They're scattered throughout the country. So again, we network with each other, and in the following slide, uh, we communicate, we meet with each other. Um, and 
one of the remarkable things about the LRN, uh, which was actually what I would have thought one of the toughest obstacles to overcome, is basically in, in the context of emergency response, be it bioterrorism or any other threat, we do all the same things and we do them all the same ways. And if you've had any uh, uh, direct uh, contact with or experience in a clinical or any laboratory that goes against our grain. We want to do things our way and the way we know, all know to be best and so on. This threw that all out the window. Um, they, in developing this network, we were all given capacity, biosafety level three capacity, uh, and containment laboratories to make sure we can work with what we work with safely, not only safe for our, our workers, but if something would happen within our facility, everything we work with is contained there. It couldn't be released elsewhere in the building, uh, much less out into the community. The really key element, though, for this network is we all, uh, uh, all the agent-specific protocols for testing we do are all consensus protocols. They were developed by the CDC, they were brought in, out into our labs to make sure they work there. Uh, we use the same reagents, everything is the same. So if you get a test for a bioterrorism agent uh, or Ebola uh, in Kansas, it's gonna be the same test that you're getting in Wisconsin. And there's a real advantage there, uh, especially in response, because you'll know the result you're getting is going to be uniform throughout the country, and that's very important. So if some people are giving you false positives, some are giving you false negatives, it'd be really tough to work with the laboratory results. Uh, they developed some, uh, uh, secure communications amongst us and with CDC, electronic laboratory reporting with CDC, which now we've begun to develop in our different states with our clinical lab and clinician partners. All of my staff have undergone advanced training down at CDC. We have to routinely go through competency assessments uh, and, and proficiency testing to make sure we're all doing the tests that have been given to us correctly uh, and reliably. Uh, special biosecurity protocols, all of my staff have to go undergo uh, 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 background checks. The, we have all sorts of security built into our laboratories now uh, for subsets of the agents we work on. A uh, number of us have to go through, uh, again, criminal background checks, uh, health suitability, psych suitability, and so on. They've really taken this serious to make sure we've got healthy, stable people working in these labs, which is a good thing, uh, but uh, it shows you the importance and, uh, that was put on uh, 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 these laboratories. And in terms of all hazards, and I'll come back to this a little different rendition, rendition a little later on, in addition to developing the methods to deal with originally, uh, sensibly, for bioterrorism threat agents, anthrax, plague, tularemia, smallpox, brucella, those things that those of you went through training for bioterrorism agents, those were the priority agents that would have the greatest impact on the population. Uh, the all hazards part comes into effect by the technologies and the methodologies we brought on board to be able to identify those agents can be applied to everything that are up on those lists. Not only in the top half of that list, things like Ebola, Zika virus, uh, SARS, uh, the influenza pandemic, I'll come back and talk about that a little later on, but the lower bullets, those, the respiratory, the routine respiratory, gastrointestinal diseases, vaccine preventable diseases, this is what we do on a day-to-day basis, but now we have the same state-of-the-art methodologies that we can apply to those. And what this means to the lab, when I started my career, for most of the agents on that list, I could get you a, a result, usually in a few days, quite often days to a few weeks for a complete characterization. The methods we now use, at least in the public health lab, can get you a result in hours in a complete characterization, uh, potentially inside of a day or two. So there has absolutely been a quantum leap 
in capability uh, in the laboratory since uh, I've been there. And again, this is capability and capacity that's at your disposal in, a, in an emergency uh, health situation. So, talk then about the other part of, of the pyramid and focus on the Sentinel laboratories. And again, I have them circled with the reference labs because in terms of uh, 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 emergency response, we work hand in glove uh, with them. And basically they were termed Sentinel laboratories. This, uh, these are the clinical laboratories throughout our state, throughout the country. They were given a very strict uh, uh, rule. Now, reference laboratories were given new techniques to confirm the presence of those unusual organisms. Our clinical labs were told, use your routine methods, um, recognize when you might be dealing with something unusual, and report that to your public health lab, rule out that you're working with one of the high consequence public health threats, and if you can't, get that to a public health laboratory so we can. That was the earliest premise, not only with the bioterrorism agents, but for all those other agents that we've put on uh, that list. So again, truly a uh, uh, all hazards approach. And again, basically the clinical labs are just doing the same methods they would apply to their uh, uh, patients that are coming through their hospitals. Uh, it's a map showing we've got 130 plus clinical labs in the state. Uh, and uh, I have a lab network coordinator who has an assistant that has a working relationship and first name basis with every one of the lab managers, lead lab managers, in every one of those laboratories. We have the contact numbers. We know how to reach the laboratory. We routinely, depending on the situation, communicate with them essentially on a day-to-day -day basis. I've got some dedicated staff who do that. And I put this up here to highlight um, the lab response capabilities. A number of, of the enhancements occurred in the public health laboratory, but a lot of these have spilled over to the clinical laboratories. New technologies are being uh, uh, developed and worked on in public health labs that we're now able to get out to the clinical laboratories. Uh, we've worked with them for 16, 17 years for emergency response guidance. How can they continue to carry out their role as Sentinel Laboratories as we get new pathogens coming into play? Obviously, communication and messaging is critical. Uh, we have exercises where we communicate with them. Uh, we do a lot of training, education with them. We have regional meetings. We have uh, monthly webinars. Uh, all of this, uh, we provide anything the Sentinel Labs are doing to support public health should not be costing them money. So we, we do have a courier system they use uh, for free. We give them all the specimen collection uh, and, and shipping supplies they need. The testing we provide on the specimens they send us are fee exempt to the laboratory and to the clinicians uh, and to the patient. Uh, so uh, all of this has developed from that LRN concept and the last one, and I think the thing I'm most uh, uh, proud of, we're one of the few states that actually has a laboratory technical advisory group that helps manage our Wisconsin Clinton Lab Network, and it's made up of leaders from a rotating group of clinical labs distributed throughout the state. We felt this was important that they need to have an ownership to the lab response capabilities and capacities we're putting in place. And by having them help direct that, particularly training meets and so on, this gives them ownership to the network. And uh, they have been, and they do this on their own time. It's really remarkable the hours they spend uh, helping this network out because they know in time of need it's going to come back and help their individual laboratories. So. Just want to interject here, there were a couple other uh, high profile uh, uh, events and concerns that have helped uh, keep that funding going here. We couldn't do all of this with a dwindling level of preparedness funding, uh, since as I pointed out, it has a benefit on the downward slide. 
Uh, my area of expertise is influenza. I've done a lot with pandemic influenza, and that represents one of the big public health, ongoing public health event, uh, uh, public health threats that we face. And right around the late 2000s, or early 2000s, when we were concerned with bioterrorism, there was a renewed concern uh, about pandemic flu because of some viruses that had emerged uh, in Asia. You may have heard of influenza A, H5N1, and a real concern that we might have a next uh, pandemic uh, imminently. This set off a whole spate of pandemic influenza planning at uh, everything from the state, national level, state level, local level, hospital level, because we would all be affected by it. Um, and in fact, we did uh, uh, suffer through a pandemic. I somewhat tongue-in-cheek uh, listed as a wimpy pandemic. Again, we've been pre pre and we continue to prepare for pandemics that could affect and kill tens and hundreds of thousands of people. In fact, this particular pandemic was less severe than most of our seasonal influenza uh, uh, outbreaks that we have. But those who lived in the hospital recognized the impact this had on the influx of patients coming in uh, and so on. Uh, the legislators saw a big enough threat here that, again, a, another fairly large pot of money uh, began to flow in to public health to bolster our ability to prepare for and plan for now pandemic influenza. And then on fairly short order, there's been a series of events after the pandemic. I have that highlighted on here. The pandemic, there was a little influx of, of funding. Uh, we were doing quite well. Then came 2014, 2015 with the large Ebola outbreak in Africa. And I never lived, I didn't think I'd lived through my career to say this, our first uh, locally transmitted cases of Ebola in the United States. And that really caught the attention of the people who provide funding and led to a large spike uh, in funding that came out to all public health and clinical communities uh, not to prepare to diagnose Ebola as much as this showed the deficiencies we had in biosafety, not only in the laboratory, but how we deal with patients and how we deal with biosafety in our, across our facilities, considering we always have sick people coming in there. Uh, this did more to improve biosafety across all our realms than any event in the previous 20, 30 years. So again, a bit of a silver lining there. And then the latest influx came uh, a year, year and a half ago with the emergence of Zika virus in South America. It spread pretty much uh, throughout Central America. And the large number of cases we've had in the US, largely due to travel, at least last year. Incidentally, if you've been uh, following, Zika's kind of dropped off the table. Uh, but that doesn't mean it has gone away. It is out there, there are still people affected in parts of the world, and we need to be prepared to respond to it. So, a couple things I want to highlight here. So we have this laboratory network, um, and uh, it was developed, again, ostensibly for bioterrorism or the high consequence uh, event. Uh, I put this up because if uh, speaking for other public health people that we interact with in my laboratory, uh, I deal with foodborne outbreaks, uh, you know, three, six, 12 of these a week uh, in, in Wisconsin. And when you look at the numbers on this slide, uh, the party line is there'll be about 50 million cases of foodborne uh, associated disease in the U.S. Uh, each and every year and kill somewhere three to 5,000 people. So we're dealing with outbreaks all of the time. Um, we now are able to do this because, again, the model works here uh, that was set up with the LRN. In terms of foodborne illnesses, we rely on what we call our WEPS program. <clears throat> and basically, it's all about sick people go to their healthcare provider and end up going to the hospital. When, in their when they're in the hospital, they have clinical specimens taken. 
The clinical labs begin to do the microbiology to identify Campylobacter and Salmonella and E. coli 0157 and Listeria. What we've developed in Wisconsin is every time they see one of those high consequence foodborne illnesses, send us the isolate and let public health know uh, that, that you've seen that patient. They do it, it comes to us as a reference laboratory. We do DNA fingerprinting that enables us to see that if we get a salmonella up in Green Bay and another one in Platteville, we can look at them and see is it the same organism? And maybe the same people or, or different people were eating the same bag of lettuce or spinach. Uh, we share this with the vision of health or Division of Health may recognize an outbreak's going to go, uh, be going on and reach out to the clinical labs. Have you seen isolates of this particular bacteria? Make sure you get it to the state laboratory so we can respond. This network then extends nationally. Uh, and I put a website on there and you'll be amazed. If you go to that website, there's a, a listing of active foodborne outbreaks that are occurring multi-state. And the reason we know they're multi-state is we do this characterization in Wisconsin, send it to a national database, and they can see if the same organism is being seen in Maryland, and have they been eating the same lettuce, or spinach, or sprouts, or whatever the vehicle is. So we have this tremendous national network in being able to monitor uh, for foodborne illnesses. And again, this all begins with the clinical lab. 95, we, we uh, keep track of, since these are reportable conditions, we feel we capture uh, approaching 98% of all of these different bacteria. What is not mandated in statute is that the clinical labs share those with the public health laboratory. They only have to report the disease. They share uh, those specimens and, and isolates from every one of those diseases on a voluntary basis. Uh, incredible and we wouldn't and, and without that we'd have nothing to test frankly at the state lab uh, in terms of foodborne illness the next big public health threat here I could have given the whole lecture just on antimicrobial resistance we've known this has been a problem for the last uh, uh, just my entire career it has really now reached a tipping point and it's particularly important to mention here because the hospitals and the clinical care settings are ground zero for this. It's not so much that this is a community-based uh, uh, public health emergency, it's happening in the hospitals. So it's different from a mass casualty and things that you're talking about more today or a shooter uh, incident. This is something that's going to continue to grow in magnitude and affect each and every one of your facilities and public health in general. And again, the same model applies. I just have listed here some of the threats. Uh, that document is a strategic plan that's been uh, put out by CDC on how we're going to address this. And basically, what was recognized in the national plan we can only get on top of this once we can recognize what organisms are the real problem and how prevalent are they. How do you think we're able to do that? The only way we're getting these organisms is from your clinical laboratories. They're doing some initial characterization. They're coming to the state lab. We do the characterization and can then identify uh, those specific uh, organisms uh, or mutations that I had on the other uh, list. So on a day-to-day -day basis, this is occupying more and more of our time. And again, this is all part of the national network. This really is now uh, a public health uh, crisis, being able to get ahead of this. And there are a couple organisms out there where we're literally down to our last um, uh, antibiotic. And if you happen to be in for a uh, heart transplant or knee trans uh, uh, a knee replacement, or long-term uh, treatment for cancer and so on, and you get infected with one of, uh, one of these, it's going to be extraordinarily hard to treat you. So this is going to be something that has huge impact. Uh, and this, there'll be a lot of presentations and talks talking about this at the state level moving uh, ahead here. It's really been identified as currently the public health uh, priority in the country. And then, 
I get to the big list here, uh, and I just wanted to briefly mention before uh, I hit uh, some of the closing uh, slides here. Um, your, when I looked at your uh, uh, agenda here, it was really looking at what are those events that might have a profound effect on the hospitals, on, on public health. Uh, and the ones that I highlighted uh, here are, we've dealt with a number of emerging threats over the last 20 years. The ones that really had the potential to have a, a huge community and hospital impact are anthrax, SARS, had it uh, expanded more than it did. Uh, that could have just as easily been uh, a moderate pandemic, the 2009 H1. We wouldn't have talked about 11,000 cases. We'd been talking about uh, uh, millions of cases. Uh, and we dodged the bullet uh, on that. <coughs> and Ebola uh, made it to hospitals in the United States. And I put these up here, just I wanted to highlight. I'm not going to deal with these one by one. But I wanted to point out <coughs> the LRN model now that is used for all of these uh, events has been the same. The threat is identified, CDC develops new diagnostic methods, they identify a subset of uh, laboratories throughout the country that can kind of field test those new methods, and Wisconsin has been one of those for the last 10 years. Once you can use, it's found that you can use those methods in the public health lab, you get it out to all public health laboratories in a timely fashion. We then become the primary diagnostic facility for the state. And depending how the outbreak goes, in the case of pandemic flu, we got overwhelmed, but we knew it was going to be a long-term event. The commercial sector began to develop tests that could then get out to the clinical lab. We then took a more of a reference role and helped the clinical labs do this testing, validate their testing, and collect their testing data and their specimens for further characterization. We applied that same model uh, with influenza and with Ebola, and, with, and we will apply it the next time a threat uh, emerges. So, kind of going down the home stretch here, and I, I want to keep on, uh, on time here. So, when you look at all the cool things I've described, and they really are, we are light years ahead of where we were. 20 years ago, uh, uh, I was going to say trust me, but I'd be careful. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to sound too presidential here. I'll, I'll say. Um, we have accomplished all of this, and, and I mean truly the global we here, not just public health, public health with our clinical and our community response partners. But as you might uh, guess, the threat still continues, right? Or uh, you would have asked me to come and talk to you. Uh, this is an ongoing threat, uh, and you need to ask why that is. And one way of doing this is you go back to the de uh, definition of, of public health, and I teach two courses on this on campus, and we talk about emerging diseases, and I teach the kids a little about public health. Public health is really about, in its, in its best form, prevention. Uh, and one has to ask, uh, I've already told you, we're improving our infrastructure and everything. Are we truly preventing emerging diseases? Well, in a sense, we are. The quicker we can identify an outbreak, we're really knocking down the magnitude of the outbreak and the time course in which that outbreak will progress. In short, we are decreasing morbidity and mortality. So we're preventing a lot of diseases, no doubt. Are we preventing the disease emergence from occurring in the first place? Clearly not. Every year we have something new emerging, and every week I'm dealing with a dozen foodborne outbreaks. So we're not really stopping it at its source. The really real questions I think you need to ask then, why do the emerging diseases continue to occur? And what are the prospects that this is going to continue in the future? The latter question is an easy one to answer. The prospects are a certainty. We are going to continue to have these uh, uh, outbreaks. We need to continue to meet like this. And we need to bolster our capability and continue to bolster our capability to respond 
and mitigate the outbreaks when they occur across all our realms, public health, public health lab, hospitals, clinical community, uh, and so on. So what I want to do, and, and this is where, I, I don't mean this to be doom and gloomy, but what it is is reality. I already told you, this isn't going to stop. We're not stopping these outbreaks, and there's some good reasons for that. And I spent the whole course getting teach, uh, students to understand that. When we went back and talked about factors of disease that were first outlined in the IOM report and why we want to know factors, then we can prevent the disease. And on first blush, that seems so straightforward. What we took us a little time to realize is uh, every disease has multiple factors. Uh, this is uh, a, a list for foodborne illnesses, and depending on the organism, four or five of those different factors are in play uh, uh, at, at once. So it's going to be really hard to prevent them from happening uh, uh, in the first place. And actually one of the exercises I carry on with my students at the beginning of the semester is throughout the semester identify one single infectious disease in which there's only one factor. Uh, they've never been able to do that. None of my professional colleagues would be able to do that. Trust me, none of you would be able to do that. Very, very complex. Furthermore, and don't worry about the detail here, disease emergence involves getting into the human population and then spreading throughout the human population. And unfortunately, at each step in the process, there's a different set of factors in play for the different diseases. So it's even more complex than that first slide. Why do I put this up here? This is a picture of, uh, of countries in the world and their gross domestic product. Warm colored are poor countries and suffer an uh, inordinate amount of infectious disease. Some 20 million deaths in these warm colored countries. Uh, uh, infectious disease still kills 60% of children <laughs> under five years of age. Uh, not only do a lot of people die, a lot of people are sick. Uh, a lot of people are out of the workplace, their quality of life uh, is, is, is shot, and these are generally poor countries to begin with. Plus, they have no public health infrastructure to speak of. So essentially, we have this unlimited source of many infectious diseases, and then that other graphic I have in the bottom, <coughs> it's estimated that this year there are nearly 4 billion airline passengers throughout the world. We're a highly mobile population. Uh, and um, so we cannot take the approach. If we're truly going to limit these diseases and ultimately uh, uh, prevent them, it's going to have to be done globally. Uh, one other threat. Probably it's estimated 50 to 60 percent of the most recent emergent disease threats actually have an animal source. So if all of these were just confined to humans, it'd be daunting enough. But a fair number of these also have normal hosts <coughs> in animal populations. So to truly con uh, control them, you're going to have to control the disease in the animal populations or it will be a constant source. Foodborne illnesses are a perfect example. Zika virus, perfect example. Ebola. Uh, influenza is actually a zoonotic disease of, of waterfowl. So there's going to be an unlimited supply of influenza that can potentially uh, uh, hurt human beings. So realistically, there's not much we're going to do about the actual preventing in the first place, at least in today's technology and today's climate. The final one, and I, I, it's not my intention to be political here, but there is another reality piece here. Uh, I, I, this really is a, a, a threat to the US. All the infrastructure I've described, and I've only s described that much of it, the lab-based infrastructure costs a lot of money to maintain. And if all of this money dries up, we simply, speaking for Wisconsin, do not have the dollars, nor I fear the commitment to keep that capacity and those capabilities in place without those federal dollars. So every model that's been put out there for replacing the health care, uh, uh, the current health care law, has bad things happening to 
realms across all of infec uh, infection disease and, and public health in general prevention and response. So the political climate here may, at least on the short term, be the biggest threat that we're going to face here. Time will tell. I think it's, to a certain extent, maybe been overstated, but there's still going to be bad outcomes here. So with that, I want to end with this slide then. And again, it wasn't my intention to be the doom and gloom part there. The fact is, that only highlights that the, the core problem is not going to go away. We're going to continue to have these uh, uh, outbreaks. So effective response to any outbreaks, and I'm pre again preaching to the crier, is all about collaboration and communication. That's why you're here. You're learning to do it better. We all work with you because we all need to do this better. What I wanted to do today is tell you a small subset of the part of public health partners that are involved at least in infectious disease, and that's our laboratories. So you're, many of you are hospital-based, uh, what I'm challenging you to do, and with your leadership, is go back, uh, know your clinical laboratory, because in any event that occurs, they're going to be intimately involved. Understand what they do. Understand what they do in your facility, because it's not at the same across the 130 labs. And then in uppercase levels, like I need the federal government to support public health, you need to support those clinical laboratories, recognizing that they do way, way more than just support basic patient care. So hopefully this talk gave you a little more of that awareness, and you do take me up on going and go down and come out of the blue and greet your lab manager. They'll probably, maybe they'll stop breathing or that, because they don't often get recognition. They say this to us a lot, and I really encourage you, they, they do work we wouldn't be able to do without them. So uh, give them a thanks for me. We thank them every turn we can get. So thanks for your attention. I don't want to stand in the way of lunch. Uh, and it, oh, it'll take me a while to uh, break down. So if there are any individual questions you want to get me on, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. Does anyone have any quick questions for Pete as long as we have him here? I don't want to have to leave without answering the question if you have, if anyone has any. I do have a couple of things I want to say about the uh, state lab. Number one, you can tell Pete is extremely committed, dedicated, and I can say that the other folks that WHA works with on an ongoing basis, they're equally as committed. It's an incredibly um, great group of people. Um, the, the other piece is on, um, I have known the PR person at the state lab since, uh, well, we actually have to be good buddies over 9-11. We get together about every two months, sometimes a little bit more, and we, we talk about all the things that are going on. Um, that Jan Clowder is an extremely great resource uh, to me. She keeps me apprised of what's going on at the lab. I keep her apprised of what's kind of what I hear from you guys. The newborn screening um, issue that we had a few, I don't know, was it a year ago, or I can't remember, it seems like yesterday. But um, we worked really closely with the state, uh, state lab and also with the Department of Health to understand the process, to communicate with you, to bring your concerns back. Um, the courier system that Pete talked about earlier, we had a lot of discussions about that, and hopefully we probably fixed some issues that were out there. But it's this great relationship that um, WHA has had with the lab. And also, um, I, I heard Pete say it, I hear Jan say it every time we get together when I say things like, we don't need that much spinach in Wisconsin. Why are we the state that has the most outbreak? She's like, we don't. We're just really good because of the clinical lab relationship that we have with the hospitals. Those things get reported. Uh, and in other states where you would have thought, you know, maybe they eat more of something or other, why wouldn't they have had more cases? Uh, we're just right on top of that. And, and you really do want to go back and say thanks to um, the lab folks in your hospitals and in your um, health systems because they really do help protect the health of Wisconsin. Uh, it's really important, and I really appreciate the relationship that we have with uh, your group, Pete, and appreciate you being here today. Same, same here. And I can just a shout out to the PIOs, and you can say you heard it from me as a senior scientist. Every senior scientist needs a PIO 
manager. <laughs> uh, Jan is terrific and be dealing with the press, dealing with the general public. Uh, we have to work hard to kind of ramp down some of the science in that and uh, I admit it, I need it, so you're all good.